the next case on our calendar, we'll give everyone a moment to uh, disperse, is Roy Dominic versus Parks Authority, Inc. Thank you. Your Honor, it's a very good morning. My name, uh, may it please the court, my name is Mr. Abdul Hassan. I'm the counsel for plaintiff appellant, Rye Dominic. This court should reverse the grant of summary judgment in defendant's favor because a proper application of the multi-factor test would reveal that each one of the factors either weigh in favor of the plaintiff or at minimum are generally disputed. And I believe that is why the defendant did not address or directly address these factors on appeal. And I'd like to go through each one of them. The first one being the relationship between plaintiff's compensation and the compensation of other workers. The district court correctly found that that factor weighed in favor of the plaintiff because there was no evidence in the record as to that factor. Keep in mind as well, typically in summary judgment appeals, it's the plaintiff that has the burden of proof and it's some element of the claim that's in dispute. Here, the exemption, the outside salesperson exemption is an affirmative defense as to which the defendant has the burden of proof and which is strictly construed against the defendant. The absence of that factor alone, given the burden of proof on the defendant, is enough for a jury to conclude that the defendant did not prove the exemption, especially in the context of the totality of the circumstances, the inadequacy of the record, the evidence as to the, uh, the other factors, and if you include additional factors such as the straining. If you look at the second factor, the uh, <coughs> free from relative supervision, that factor is equally consistent with his technician work because the district court pointed out that the lack of direct supervision, the best evidence of it is that he performed his work away from the office. Well, he also performed his technician work away from the office and he uh, was, there was less need for supervision of his technician work because Mr. Rosenthal or whoever else was a but supervisor. That is a, that's still a factor um, that is the lack or absence of supervision that in your, not to your client's benefit, but to the other side. Is that right? Say, say the it. lack of supervision. No, the lack of supervision is to indicate, one of the indicators. Generally, you use it to indicate that the plaintiff was performing exempt work. But in this case, it happens to be that the non-exempt work is also consistent with lack of supervision because it was performed away from the defendant's offices. So if you adjust the analysis for the fact of this case, that factor actually weighs, is more indicative of non-exempt work than it is of exempt work because both were performed away from the office and moreover, because the defendant has the burden of proof, if there's a tie, the tie goes in the plaintiff's favor. The third factor, the amount of time spent doing work, uh, doing alleged exempt work. There was no finding as to how much time was spent doing exempt work. What, what was the record evidence about what proportion of time your client spent delivering and installing equipment that he himself sold as opposed to delivering equipment that was sold by others? There was no evidence. There was District no. Court, in its own decision at A429, A429, remarkable finding. He said, it is not clear to what extent the plaintiff sold the, li the lifts that he installed. If it's not clear, you can't conclude it's undisputed. It's just an, and, and, and the reason the court had to make that con con conclusion, there is no evidence that he sold any piece of equipment which he then specifically installed or serviced or do anything of the kind. And did you, did you have uh, evidence regarding his just installation work and delivery work? Yes, he tested. Showing that that, that uh, was the predominant uh, way he spent his time. Yes, even though we don't have the burden of proof and we can sit a trial and watch them prove or disprove their, the, the exemption. He testified about that. He testified extensively about that. Remember, this is a guy that worked there for 30 years as a technician, was trained as a technician. His testimony was a little uh, confusing. Sometimes he said he was a salesman. 
sometimes he said he wasn't? Well, one, at the start of the deposition, there was a slip in which he said sales and he corrected himself. He was nervous, as is common at the outset of a deposition. But if you look, remember, with the exemption, it's the actual duties test that matters, not titles or, look, I, I myself maybe too frequently confuse plaintiff and defendant. And I noticed in my brief, I was just reading it again, I mixed up exempt and non-exempt. I, I didn't mean to say. You think it was a slip of the tongue when he said sales, that wasn't a concession. It was obviously a slip of the tongue. And moreover, if, as, as I pointed out, if he was to take a bullhorn and say I was a salesman, that's not the test. The test is to look at his actual duties. The defendant has to put on evidence of his actual duty. And, uh, you know, Justice Sotomayor was hearing a case at a high court a couple of weeks ago involving the FLSA and whether or not similar but not identical, uh, where they were trying to argue that a salesman and a technician were the same. And she correctly told Paul to comment. He said, it's scary to think that when somebody looks up the hood of my car at a car dealership, the guy's a salesman. It's even just as scary to a jury to think that a salesman is performing OSHA inspections, inspections required by the federal government for safety reasons. Uh, life and death at stake, these lifts are huge. You look at the entire evidence, every one of the factors, the amount of work, they, not only was there no specific finding as to how, how much time was spent doing sales work, the court made a, a significant error by categorizing a s significant portion of plaintiff's technician work is inspections, installations, repairs, uh, repairs, inspections, and so on as, as part of sales, but he could not make the finding in response to the earlier question that they, any of that was on equipment that he sold, which is critical, which is necessary for that finding. Uh, my, I see my time is up. You have reserved two minutes. For Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Douglas Rowe, um, appearing for Appellee Parts Authority. Parts Authority. Aren't there facts all over this place that are undecided? I don't believe there are. I believe that the, that the evidence clearly supports Judge Glass's conclusion. Parts Authority is, a part, uh, is an auto parts retailer. That's what they do. They had one outside salesman, Roy Dominic. Roy would go door to door, auto parts shop to auto, par uh, auto repair shop to auto repair shop, selling, um, selling parts. That was his primary duty. Didn't he do servicing of the, of the equipment when he got there? The only servicing he did was the servicing of the lifts that he installed. He did occasional servicing of those lifts. Uh, uh, let me just point out the, the issue, because I believe that this, the issue of the lifts was a red herring. We've explained, it was explained in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the record that R Roy Dominic's duties were uh, outside sales. At some point in time during the course of the relationship, he asked if he could perform the lift installations, which had previously been performed by an outside contractor. We agreed. He asked if he could do that in lieu of a contractor. He owned the tools to perform as an outside contractor would. He had a deal for the installations. Those were his words. I had a deal to perform the installations, separate and apart from his sales duties. He also hired his own helpers. They were not helpers that were employed by Parts Authority. They were his own helpers. So this whole concept of, of the lifts. Does Parts Authority make the lifts? No, Parts Authority is, uh, is, is, is sells the lifts. They, Roy, by others. Roy Dominic sold the lifts. He then asked if he could also install them. So that's why. He had his own business on the side. He had his own business on the side. Was oh. there a factual finding uh, regarding what percentage of time the plaintiff spent performing exempt activity? I, I believe there was, and I would like to address that. First of all, let me point out that Roy Dominic says 80% of his time was performed as a technician. The other 20% of his time was performed at, on technician-related work. So he'd, he'd like the court to believe that he performed no sales duties whatsoever. That was his sworn testimony. That was his sworn testimony. That completely flies in the face of the evidence we've submitted. Here's the, pro here's the problem. Here's the problem. You might be right. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and he might have lied in his sworn testimony, but we've got a, a sworn testimony by, uh, by Mr. Dominic 
and you dispute that. You dispute the percentage of time that he uh, spent installing lifts and, and so on as opposed to cells. Well, why isn't that a genuine dispute of fact that ought to go to trial? There's a six-year par period covered by this case, statute of limitations. Our records show that, that he installed 111 lifts. Mm -hmm. He testified at one point he installed a couple of hundred lifts. That's 200. At some point, he also testified that he installed your records, 350 lifts. Your records bump up against his testimony. Well, what, no, yeah, no, no, no. Here, there's testimony that's not crazy. No, Judge Glasser then took the testimony of Mr. Dominic, and he assumed that Mr. Dominic installed 350 lifts as he testified. He did the analysis because Roy Dominic also testified how much it would take for each lift installation. He assumed. 3.5 hours per lift, more or less, all right? So he assumed, uh, Judge Glasser did an analysis on page 14 of his decision and concluded that even assuming what Roy Dominic is saying, that he installed 350 lifts, that it was still not his primary duty, that it was, that, that it didn't rise to the, it, it didn't rise to a sufficient level in order to, for him to establish that his primary duty was anything other than sales. With that said, the evidence e exists that otherwise, that, and we believe that his primary duty was sales. There's a document sh with 600 comments over a two-year two year period showing comments like- Was it a longer period than two years? Yes, but I, the, the, the document I'm, I'm pointing to was over a two-year period. He actually worked for 30 years, but the statute of limitations period is so six is years. But his comments are, tried to get more business from this guy, working on getting more business. I guess my talk to the owner paid off. I mean, these so are- He says this while he's out servicing and doing other things. No, he's saying this because his primary duty is sales. He's coming, he's reporting his sales efforts. Um, he, he, he writes, new account, sold them a bunch of stuff. I mean, these are his entries in his so what, sales so, journal. So, so let me just understand yes. your position because it's very important. Yes. What you are saying is that we should, in effect, disregard his testimony, um, although you may be something, saying something else when you talk about the district court's calculation and analysis, but in effect, disregard his testimony because the overwhelming evidence, documentary and otherwise, uh, refutes that testimony. That's correct. And by the way, but if that's... <laughs> His own testimony, not just the overwhelming evidence, the overwhelming em evidence including uh, his own testimony. Um, his own testimony. Again, the, the Judge Glasser found that much of Dominic's deposition contradicts his assertion that he undertook visits to customers in the capacity of a technician. Um, Judge Glasser found that despite Dominic's inconsistent claims to the contrary at his deposition and his, in his declaration opposing the motion, the record evidence shows that he was an outside salesman first and foremost. Judge Glasser also said no reasonable fact finder could conclude that the plaintiff was anything other than an outside salesman with a technical background rather than, as he contends, a technician with minimal sales duties. Again, it's a primary duty test. What was his primary duty? The primary duty is defined under the, uh, under the CFR as the principal, main, major, or most important duty that the employee performs. And that's determined based on all the facts in a particular case with the major emphasis on the character of the employee's job as a whole. Again, he was a salesman who performed duties of lift installation on the site. And by the way, he also testified, Roy Dominic did, that the primary duty of the lift install or of the, the repairs to the lifts was to sell parts. I mean, those were his words. Um, uh, A225. I'm sorry, what? what uh, 225. That says, what was the purpose behind the inspection from the standpoint? Inspection, to make sure the lift was safe. Was it also to sell parts? Repair, I would just inspect. But wasn't it also to sell parts if needed? If needed, he says. Yeah. But that doesn't suggest that that's the primary duty. How does that make that an undisputed fact? 
that sales was the primary the ultimate part the ultimate purpose was to sell parts if needed well his testimony was that his sales activity was incidental to his servicing and inspecting work and the district court discounted the servicing inspector and delivery work as incidental to sales but it seems to me that's making a finding that belongs to the jury which one is more compelling uh, par a parts argument or mr dominic's testimony well the judge chose among competing equally uh, plausible um, views of how he spent his time he, he he did not testify that the inspections were incidental to his technician um, duties in his deposition I you know I, I, I want to point out point out that the you know where, where there's a where, where there's a where there's a deposition and then there's an inconsistency with a uh, affidavit in support or in opposition to the motion uh, the Second Circuit can it has been known to be reluctant to credit a party's no, 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 no. where this is said is the inconsistency has got to be unequivocal absolutely clear and what you're telling us is that there is a lack there's some lack of clarity but he's for the most part said so certain things it seems to be um, not borne out by other documentary evidence there's some contradiction in his uh, testimony but are you making the argument that it's unequivocally um, rebutted by his own prior testimony or anything else? Well, I am because, because of the documentary evidence here in his own words, in his own handwriting, emails that he would send showing his sales efforts. I mean, this is what, this is what he did. It's, it, I think that it's clear that the court was, the lower court was correct in making this determination based upon the, the weight of the evidence and the documentary evidence and and Mr. Dominic's own testimony. Um, your time has expired. Thank you. Mr. Hassan has reserved two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, yes, Your Honor. In terms of contradictions, um, uh, counsel highlighted what I think he meant to be one of the contradictions that the plaintiff testified he did a couple or a few hundred uh, installations, but in his declaration he said 350. There's no inconsistency there. 350 is a few hundred. Uh, then the testimony read, um, from the bench just now clarified the entirety of his testimony that, for example, what he said was he would go to the job, if something is broken, he'll order it so he can perform his job. Like some, a technician comes to your house, he, say, he calls back to your office, he said, look, the compressor is broken, or he orders a compressor. That's the, that's the type of stuff he was talking about. Um, the council, I think Council and the District Court realized that the technician work was an insurmountable obstacle. Council tried to in, uh, invoke in an outside, an independent contractor argument on top of the exemption argument. That makes the issues of fact double. Um, and I think the law court was correct to reject the outside contractor argument because there was no credible evidence to back it up. And even if you considered it, it is e even more fact intensive than the already fact-intensive exemption argument. And notably, Your Honor, the three leading cases, Clower, Martinez, and Kalari, that the district court cited for the legal standard, were all cases which the district court rejected or found that there were disputes of fact and did not grant summary judgment. Three, two of the three cases cited by, of, of the main cases cited by defense counsel, um, Motor, Ackerman, were trial ca cases that were resolved at trial because of the fact intensive nature of the exemption. Um, so you look at the record here, not only is it insufficient, there's issues of fact all over the place and I kindly urge you to reverse the grant of summary judgment. In Thank you. Case. Thank you both. We'll reserve decision. Next case on our calendar is on submission. So I will ask the clerk to adjourn court.